Welcome to CalPERS School Employer Advisory Committee webinar. Next slide, please. I am Susan Four, and I'm your moderator this morning, and William Greenhalgh is our host. This event is being recorded. For closed captioning, please click on the link at the top of the Q&A box. So thank you for joining us today for the May 2021 SEAC webinar. Today, you'll be hearing some of the latest updates on services, programs, and policies related to your work with CalPERS. The presentation will take about two hours, which includes a 10-minute break. There'll be time for questions following each presentation and at the general roundtable before break. Next slide, please. We do have a few housekeeping items. Um, as I mentioned, this is being recorded and it will be available on the CalPERS website next week. All attendees' microphones are muted. Today's meeting materials are available on our CalPERS SEAC webpage. But if you have any problems locating the materials, please feel free to email the SEAC mailbox and we'll make sure to get those to you. That email is calpers underscore SEAC at calpers.ca.gov. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them to all panelists into the Q&A feature by clicking on the little Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Next slide, please. So we've gathered several CalPERS leaders and team members for this event. Andrea Peters will be giving us a legislative update. Andy Nguyen from Pension Contracts will provide information about charter school contracting process. Paul Cheetah will share information regarding required contribution rates. And Megan Cordy will update us on my CalPERS system enhancements. Our senior leaders from the Employer Account Management Division, Renee Ostrander, Brad Hansen, Christina Rollins <clears throat> will lead us in the question and answer session just before break. Then when we return from break, Rihanna Lawadi, Ron Ashcraft, and Sierra Tafoya Perry will present information on employment certification. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our first presenter, presenter Andrea Peters. Next slide, please. Good morning. Again, my name is Andrea Peters, and I am here to present the CalPERS State Legislative Update. Today, I will be discussing three bills, the Retirement Omnibus Bill, Senate Bill 634, and two bills that the CalPERS Board of Administration recently took action on, Assembly Bill 845 and Senate Bill 411. In April, CalPERS team members requested that the CalPERS board approve the addition of two technical provisions to Senate Bill 634. The first provision confirms, conforms the paperwork process for CalPERS members electing to continue as CalPERS members in CalSTRS positions to the CalSTRS paperwork process that was signed into law last year. This amendment will not change any of the eligibility requirements related to members making this election. It simply makes conforming changes to which entities receive the election form paperwork. The second provision makes a clarifying amendment to the notification provisions of a state-funded health benefit program for the surviving spouses of specified safety officers. The amendment would clarify that CalPERS can receive notification of a safety officer's death from any reliable and verifiable source, eliminating any ambiguity that exists in current law. The CalPERS board has approved the addition of these two provisions to Senate Bill 634. CalPERS team members are currently working with legislative staff to have these provisions added to the bill. This bill has passed out of the state Senate and is on the state assembly desk. Our second bill, Assembly Bill 845, establishes COVID-19 related illnesses as a rebuttable presumption that for a disability retirement, the employee contracted COVID-19 from the work environment. This provision will automatically sunset on January 1st, 2023. For CalPERS, this bill will not change any administrative processes, 
nor will it alter the disability or industrial disability retirement eligibility for CalPERS members. However, this bill would provide more assurance that members who can no longer work due to contracting COVID-19 will be eligible for a disability retirement. The CalPERS board has taken a support position on this bill. Assembly Bill 845 has passed out of the State Assembly and is pending referral in the State Senate. Our final bill, Senate Bill 411, removes the mandate to reinstate a retired member for violations of the working after retirement laws, while allowing reinstatement if circumstances warrant it. This bill is similar to last year's Assembly Bill 2365. This amendment to existing law would provide CalPERS, employers, and retired members the opportunity to resolve working after retirement violations more efficiently. Reinstatement can involve significant costs to the retired member, including the loss of accrued cost of living adjustments. Rather than reinstatement, Retirees could pay penalties consistent with the amount of time working in violation. This bill will not change the rules and requirements for those who work after retirement, nor does it reduce CalPERS authority to impose reinstatement. Rather, it simply provides an additional option to resolve working after retirement violations. The CalPERS board has taken a support position on this bill. Senate Bill 411 has passed out of the State Senate and is on the State Assembly desk. This concludes my presentation. A full bill list will be provided to all attendees after this meeting. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Andrea. Next up is um, Andy. Good morning. My name is Andy Nguyen, CalPERS team member. I'm here this morning to present the overall contracting process and timeline for the charter school to participate in CalPERS defined benefit plan via the County of Office of Education's contract with CalPERS. Next slide, please. In 2011, the Internal Revenue Service issue an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, create factors for determinations whether an agency is a political subdivision of a state for the purpose of qualifying to participate in the governmental defined benefit plans, such as CalPERS. In 2015, the IRS, the IRS issued another notice, introduce relief factors specific to the charter school. CalPERS fully implement these regulations into our review process for all charter schools in order to mitigate risk to CalPERS plans. This slide shows the main criteria for charter school to be eligible to participate in our system. Uh, we want to ensure the charter school is a public charter school, either the school district or the County Office of Education or the state approve the operation of the charter school. Uh, we also want to ensure the charter school has a right to participate in the CalPERS system. Typically, we review the charter petitions to ensure the petition allows the employees to participate in the CalPERS system. We also look at the governmental control. We review the compartment compositions of the charter school board to ensure adequate oversight. And for the fiscal responsibility, we review the primary source of funding to ensure the charter school is financially sound to incur the additional pension expense. And lastly, we also want to ensure the ownership of the charter school um, assets. Uh, upon the dissolution, we want to ensure uh, the charter school have a, a proper um, so way to dissolute the assets 
and it go back to another governmental entity or another public school. Um, you um, on our website, you, there's a link to the uh, school application question uh, questionnaire. You need to complete those questionnaire along with the certification form. And, um, then we also uh, request for some additional documents, such as the charter petition, to make sure that when you submit the charter petition, it's not the expired one, or uh, if, it's, if it's close to renewal, uh, then let us know and or give us the renewal uh, petition. The article of incorporations, the bylaws of the charter school, and the audited financial state uh, report. If the charter school is a new uh, established school, then we will ask the uh, ch charter school to provide to us the um, budget or forecast for the next couple of fiscal years. Basically, what we are trying to do is want to have all the supporting documents for our review to ensure the charter school is qualified to participate in CalPERS. Next slide, please. This slide shows the overview of the process and the timeline. The eligibility review process takes approximately one to two months, depending on the documents we receive. If uh, upfront, if we receive all the documents upfront, um, then and, you know, and we don't have that much follow-up questions, this process can um, uh, complete sooner. Once we um, um, complete our eligibility review, then um, our team will set up the account for the charter school on the system and work with the payroll units to um, set up the payroll schedule. Uh, that, that's when the, um, the charter school can enroll the uh, members into the system. And the, the, the last process should take about one to two weeks. Next slide, please. This slide shows you uh, how you can contact us. Um, best way to contact uh, our team is uh, email to our mailbox. We will to uh, answer your questions uh, more promptly. Then you can, go, can also go to the uh, CalPERS website to download the school and applicant questionnaire. And on this link, uh, they actually will provide more additional information what we will need for the charter school to uh, initiate a contracting process with CalPERS. Next slide, please. This concludes my uh, presentation. I'm happy to answer the question or we can wait into the Q&A section. Okay, thank you, Andy. Um, next up is Paul. Thank you, Susan, and good morning, everyone. I'm the actuary for the school's pool, and we recently finalized the employer contribution rates for this upcoming fiscal year. And so I'll spend a few minutes for summarizing the key results. Next slide, please. So the fiscal year 21-22 rates, which are what we just finalized, are based on evaluation date of June 30 of 2020. So this is the as of date, if you will, for the assets and the census data. Uh, there were two particular incidents, I would say, this year that uh, drove the results. Uh, the first was investment return of 4.7% uh, in the fiscal year ending June 30, 2020. Now, since this was a little bit lower than our 7% target, it did serve to uh, slightly increase the rates for fiscal year 21-22. Next slide, please. Now, the other significant event was the $904 million that the state contributed in July of 2019. Now, as you may recall, this $904 million uh, was spread over three fiscal years in the form of supplanting payments that serve to reduce the, the employer contribution rate that schools employers pay. So for this coming, upcoming fiscal year, for 21-22, uh, it reduced the employer contribution rate by 2.16% of payroll. It also uh, served to increase the funded status because we got a big inf infusion of cash, a one-time uh, infusion, and that served to increase the funded status at that point in time of 
by about 0.8%. Now, since the supplanting payments, uh, essentially, uh, it, the money came in it, sort of in advance, and there'll be a little bit less employer money coming in over that three-year period. So that, that 0.8% increase in funding status, you can think of as um, just an increase that would have taken place gradually over a three-year period, but instead it's that 0.8% kind of happened all at once. Next slide, please. Here we're showing the key results. Uh, the top half shows the assets, liability, and the funded status. And you can see that the funded status ticked up slightly, uh, increased a modest 0.1% up to 68.6%. Uh, the bottom half shows the contribution rates for fiscal year 21-22, as long as the, the prior year for comparison purposes. Now you can see their employer contribution rate is going to increase from 20.7% of payroll to 22.91% of payroll. So about a 2.2% increase. Now this is slightly less than we were projecting last year. Uh, last fall when we did our estimate of what the rate would be, uh, we came up with 23.0. So it's a shade lower than that. Uh, but, most of the, but it is still an increase over the prior year. And most of that increase, the primary driver of that are scheduled increases in payments on unfunded liability that existed already existed prior to this valuation. So even before we did this June 30, 2020 valuation, uh, we already knew that the rates were going to increase by about percent and a half, um, 1.5%. Uh, the additional increase to get up to that 2.2% increase is attributable to the fact that the state supplanting payment for the coming fiscal year is a little bit smaller than it was for the prior fiscal year. So the state is essentially giving a little bit, a little bit less aid in this coming fiscal year, which means that the schools employers need to contribute a little bit more to compensate for that. Now we also determine the rates that PEPRA members pay. So it's not just the employer rates we do, we also come up with the PEPRA member rates. And like most PEPRA members in the system, they are required by law to contribute half of the normal cost of their benefit. But a change in the rate is only triggered when the normal cost of their benefit changes by more than 1% um, from the basis in effect at any given time. Now, that didn't happen this year. The normal cost did not change by 1%. So the PEPRA members, their rate will not change. It will continue to be 7% of pay. Okay, next slide, please. So lastly, as part of the evaluation, we updated our projection of what we think rates will look like in the coming years. So you can see here uh, the 22.91% that we uh, established that the board approved for this coming fiscal year. And then you see the following five years. And again, these are just estimates. These are our best guess at this point in time based on the information we have of what the rates uh, might look like in the next five years. And you can see the, you know, there's a, a bit of a pronounced jump from fiscal year 21, 22 to 22, 23. Uh, the majority of that is due to the state's supplanting payments going away altogether. So that $904 million that came in, it was spread over three fiscal years. Uh, fiscal year 21, 22 is the third and final fiscal year of that assistance. So that's why you get, that's the primary reason for the big jump to the following year. So what you see here is we're currently expecting the, contribu the employer contribution rate to peak around fiscal 25, 26, before it starts to decline. Now, one very important caveat on this slide is that this assumes investment return of 7% every year um, following June 30, 2020. Now, the fiscal year we're in now, uh, you know, the year-to-date return is quite a bit above 7%, um, but that's not reflected here. We're just assuming that even in this year that there's 7% return. So I, I say that to say that if we do, fingers crossed, end up with fiscal um, a investment return for this fiscal year that uh, is north of 7%, then that will help bring these rates down a little bit. Okay, so let's, we gotta wait and see what happens. We have until June 30 of this year to see where the investment return ends up, but knock on wood, uh, we'll get something north of seven and we can hopefully help bring this projection down a little bit. Um, Paul, before you move on to the next item, we do have a couple of questions. So I wanted to um, make sure to get those to you. Uh, the first one is the employer rate for 21-22, when can we expect a circular letter stating the school rate? 
The circular letter for those rates typically comes out in May or June. Uh, we don't, as far to my knowledge, there's not a specific date, but yeah, it's, it's typically in the May or June time period. And actually, we're just getting the process started on that now, so it, it is it is front of mind for us. Perfect. Okay, that's all we have. Okay, and actually, the next that's uh, you can move to the next slide, but really, we're just uh, that is the end of the remarks I had prepared. So I'm happy to take any other questions about the rates or the projected rates. So I think that's it. Look, Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, okay, so I just saw Q and A just came in. Oh, okay. um, is the is the twenty is the twenty two point nine one percent rate the final rate, or is or is it subject to change? Um, as of now, it's the final rate. So we in the actuarial office determined that amount. It went to the board. The board has approved that rate. Now, it, it, technically, it could change if there is uh, legislation at the state level that somehow affects it. So let's say the state decides that they want to put some more money to the school's pool, you know, if they want to make more supplying payments. If that were to happen, and I'm not saying it is, I'm not saying I know anything, but just hypothetically, if that were to happen, then it could go back and uh, result in a revision to the rate. Now, if, if that happens late enough in the process, then what might end up happening is that the 22.91% rate will be effective for a period of time until such time that the rate is revised to reflect something like that. So, but the short answer to the question is, as far as we know now, yes, that 22.91 rate is final. Let's see, uh, another question, the employee rate for Classic is still 7% and Pepper is 7%. Uh, are these final also? Yes, yeah, so the Classic rate is set by statute. Uh, this is the employee rate we're talking about. So the Classic rate is set by statute and is 7%. The Pepper rate is based on half of normal costs, like I mentioned, and that, coincidentally is also 7%. Uh, and yes, those are final. Even if anything happens uh, at, a, at a legislative level uh, regarding say, you know, some kind of, you know, additional pay UAL payments or supplying payments, that's not going to affect the employee rates. So for all intents and purposes, yes, those 7% rates for both the classic and pepper group, uh, groups um, are, are final. So I have just more questions coming in here. They're actually coming in faster than, oh, I see they're, some are being clicked as answers. Um, so if it is revised, another question is, if it is revised after July 1, 2021, will it be retroactive? Um, so I'm gonna assume that ties back into the hypothetical that I um, that, that I mentioned, It like say the state does put some more money. And again, this is, that's purely hypothetical. But if that were to happen, and if it happens after July 1, which it possibly could, um, uh, then would it be a retroactive? The way it would work, it, let's just say that there's the same sort of scenario where there's a supplanting payment where the state basically throws some money at the school's pool to reduce the employer rate. If that were to happen again, and if it were not to happen in time for there to, um, for it to be reflected before the beginning of the fiscal year, then it, it, it essentially, it, it would not be retroactive in the sense that uh, if you, you start paying the 22.91% for say a couple months and then it's adjusted, um, the calculations would, would be done such that prospectively the rate, the employer or the school's employer rate would be reduced. So you pay 22.91% for X number of months. Uh, and then if there's some extra money coming in and the employer rate is reduced, it would be reduced prospectively to whatever the new rate is that gets you to the correct number for the, for the whole year. Um, so no, it would not be retroactive in that sense. Yeah, I don't see any other questions. I don't know, Susan or Renee, if you see anything else, but um, I believe that's all. Yeah, that looks like it's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Okay. Um, let's move on to Megan. Hello, everybody. I am going to be talking about recent enhancements, future enhancements, and a few reminders. Next slide, please. Okay, so we recently made some enhancements to a few items in my CalPERS. The first one is that the certificated member indicator um, is now available online only. It's optional for XML, um, but we do want you to use it for online for now. And then this second one here, which says payroll errors for lump sums, Brad and I anticipated you might have a lot of questions on these. So I'm going to 
briefly tell you about the enhancement, but any questions specific to this one, Brad will answer uh, shortly. So we recently implemented new payroll reporting validations in my CalPERS, one for reporting of excess service credit within an earned period and the other for reporting of excess special compensation within an earned period. Um, in the event that these errors occur, or I'm sorry, these validations occur, you will receive a new error message. Um, and if special compensation amount exceeds the allowable limit, um, you will get a different message. And then both of these validations, when the thresholds are met, the records will error and not post until the error is resolved. And Brad will go into this a little bit more in detail. For the notice of appointment change letters, we made some changes to when the form will generate. So now when there is an enrollment level change, they, the members will get a copy of this letter. And additionally, the um, County Office of Education will receive a CC on this letter for every time this letter is generated. Um, we do have a report for certificated members. This report is dependent on an annual batch process. Um, so that is something to keep in mind when running this report. Next slide, please. We do have some future enhancements. One of them is pertaining to certificated members and the XML, as I mentioned earlier. This field will now be mandatory as of June 19th um, with our next system release. We did send out to all XML filers um, a copy of the updated schemas and definitions document to help you update your files. Um, the demographic change notification, this will be in August, will now also generate when we internally in CalPERS make updates to certain demographics for a member on their behalf. We have also made some changes to verbiage within the letter for clarity. As far as future Cognos report updates, there will be no visible changes on your end. Um, these are mostly changes to background processes, mostly applying to the retirement appointment reconciliation that will allow for better data on your end. So we encourage you to use the retirement appointment reconciliation report um, as you will be receiving better data. And before I move on to my next slide, I'm gonna to check to see if I have any questions using one small screen. Uh, the name of the certificate member report is, I believe it's certificated member report, but I will get this for sure. And um, I have a friend who's helping to answer the questions. Let's see here. I think that I can't read at the same time. I apologize. Um, so we have a question, which is when auditing to make sure the certificated member indicator is activated on the profile, older appointments are requiring election documentation be uploaded. So I believe this is something we are aware of. So I will take this offline once I'm done here and do a little bit of research. Hopefully I can have an answer to you by the end of this session. If not, we will um, definitely answer you through the SEAC mailbox. And then anything that's payroll related, I'm gonna hold off for Brad. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm gonna move on to the next part. Oh, sorry, Teresa, just that one. And you mentioned the schema, the file is changing. The employers were notified. Can you please share the notification to all of us? So the notification, it, it was an email that was sent out from our shared mailbox from my team. So we did send out the, the emails to everybody who is a file uploader and or a FTP reporter. So we sent that out uh, in February. I will double check to make sure specifically everybody did receive this after I'm done with the presentation, um, but I do have a copy of what we sent and I can also send that through the SEAC mailbox um, as well. So you guys have a copy that way. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, yes, we're on that one, perfect. Okay, so we have two things on this slide. Um, this is just a generic reminder to use the undeliverable address report. Um, 
This is especially useful right now since we a lot of us aren't in the office and this is helping to keep member um, address information updated and accurate so that members can receive their communications. And then CalPERS um, initiated an automat automated separation process last July. Um, and just as a reminder, this excludes people who are on a leave of absence, but it does include people where you are just confirming that payroll is missing. Um, confirmation of missing payroll does not exclude them from this process. So we do recommend you report payroll. Um, and if there is no payroll to report, we do offer the ability to report zero payroll. If the member has been permanently separated, you as the employer are able to rescind the permanent separation. However, keep in mind that unless payroll is reported after the rescission is put in place, the member may be included in the next rounds of automated separations. And let me just see if I have any questions here. Um, nothing on those two things. And then Monica, I'll need to read your question <laughs> a few times here. So um, let me take a look. Um, Monica, if you're talking about the XML schema, I will have to take a look at that as well. Um, and then I will get you an answer offline. But are there any questions related to maybe the automated separations, retirement appointment reconciliation, or other enhancements we've discussed? Um, probably one more, Megan, that was right at the end that said, how can we determine if Cal, oops, it just moved on me. Yeah, mine, it doesn't scroll for me for some reason. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it says, how can we determine if CalPERS automated, uh, separated, and not the district? And oh. I, I'm not okay. quite, thought, I'm not reading it right. We have to take the end date off of a lot of members. So I think they're asking, when did we do the auto separation? When did they, like you're talking about the auto separation and them having to remove dates, which they shouldn't be removing in dates, but. Oh, thank you. Okay, yeah. That I just rolled helped. through on my end. Helped. So sorry. Okay, so um, within the appointment summary detail page, you should be able to see how the permanent separation was applied and it will not give, not give an internal or an external name or say CalPERS. It, it will give a batch number or a updated by system number. That's the best way to identify it. Um, CalPERS, unless you've called into the contact center, is not going to manually remove them. So they will either be included in the automated process or it's going to be somebody um, on the employer's end who is performing that permanent separation. In the future, there will be a better way to tell um, because this will be a permanent batch process along with a report. Um, but unfortunately, that is something that we are targeting for later next year. And then I don't remember hearing you say it, Megan, but somebody had asked, how often is that separation done? We run the process on the last day of the month. So it is once a month right now. So we run the process right before we run the process to pull in new appointments for the retirement appointment reconciliation. Which would be another way for the employers to know potentially if it's not the last day of the month, then we definitely didn't do it. Exactly. And, and it would be, it's business day too. So keep that in mind for the, the last day of the month. Sundays don't. Um, and then if you ever have questions on who was um, separated, you are free to email the employer technical support email box to ask for a list of anybody within your agency who was separated for that month, and we will provide that to you. I will send that through the CEC mailbox so you have that as well. Um, 
and that's all I see on my end. They, they come through and they disappear. So sorry. Did I miss anything? Okay. Um, I'm just trying to look to double check, Megan. There was one question. You yes. mentioned the file, uh, the schema, if the file is changing and employers were notified, can you please share the notification that went to all of us? Then I think there was another question regarding, hey, could you send it again? Yes, so I'll send it again through, um, just to make sure we catch everybody in this meeting, I will send it again to Susan so we can send it through SEAC. It was an email only, and it only goes to the email addresses we have on file for the um, agencies who do XML upload. So I will, I will send a copy of that right after this meeting so Susan can get that to everybody. Ah, we have a new one. The automated separations causing issues when, with the business partner when they are not requesting the separation. We are automatically doing it, and they want to know as to why when the member is still active. Um, so Deborah, the reason we're doing this is because we don't have payroll reported and the member is not on leave. So we do generate a notification to the member um, and when the member lets you know, um, it's usually so that there's some action that we could take. Um, we mean, sorry, you guys can take. So um, you would either want to report payroll um, or if the member has been on leave, update that in our system. So it's that our system is not accurately reflecting any data you may have on your end. So you'll wanna check um, my CalPERS for that information. And then Juanita, um, it's, the list is by division, but we can also do it for um, COE. It just depends on, you know, who is requesting the information. So if, if you wanted to send in an email and say you want it for the entire county office of education and all of the agencies, we we should be able to help you out with that because that's how um, we, we have the ability to do that. Just send us an email and we will help you out. And then I have, I owe Cindy an answer, but I will have to do that offline. Okay. Any other questions on system enhancement? Oh, see, they're, they're rolling. <laughs> For undeliverable address, should employers manually make the change or should the members complete the CalPERS address change form? Um, for active employees, um, you'll, you'll want them to complete the address change form that you might have, and then you enter that information into my CalPERS because as the employer, you are responsible for the member's demographic information and any changes that CalPERS makes um, on behalf of the member can be overridden by what is in your side um, of CalPERS since you're the data owner for the member. And yes, then, Juanita, the division yeah, can request yeah. the, um, the list themselves. What is the correct way to handle an employee who has been separated but is still employed, just has no earnings without taking out the end date? Um, so Vanessa, you'll, you'll want to submit zero payroll um, if they have not had any earnings. If they are on a leave of absence, you'll wanna input a leave of absence. So those are the two options. And then there's a question here on classified subs do not always work consistently every month. This, oh, sorry, it moved. <laughs> classified subs do not always work consistently every month. This constant separation appointment can be difficult to keep up with. Could it possibly be done on a fiscal year basis? Unfortunately, we can't do it on a fiscal year basis because we are following um, the six month rule of pepper classic determinations and out, just outside of schools, it can also um, affect other people when they are getting a new position. And we have had to um, reclassify some positions or change their enrollment level because of incorrect data in the system. 
So this is why we recommend that you do zero payroll if they are not working. Um, and then, like I've said before, leaves of absences are also an available option. Hey, Megan. Yes. Um, we're going to take the, the rest of your questions. I think so, too. Um, I'm going to type them out. <laughs> okay, great. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, we're going to move on. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Megan. So at this time, Renee, Brad, and Christina, and the rest of the panelists are available to answer your questions. Please submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, so Brad, do you want to share some information before we start with the general questions? Yes, <clears throat> I'm sure a lot of the Q&A is surrounding the new payroll rules that we implemented a few weeks ago. Um, so before we begin, um, I just wanted to let you know that um, as of this weekend, on starting on Monday, we have set that error to an exception. And so your payroll will no longer air out if your special comp exceeds any of the comp limits that we sent into the system. You know, having said that, you know, the purpose behind adding this rule to the system was we wanted to avoid any lump sums from being reported into our system, as well as any non-compliant special comp information into the system. You know, over the past two, three years, we've seen quite a few um, nasty audit findings surrounding lump sum reporting and non-compliant special comp. So with that pending le legislation that's coming, the SB 278, where an employer could be on the hook for any overpayments or ongoing um, liabilities um, based off of that, that erroneous reporting, we um, wanted to implement this rule to try to assist employers from avoiding putting bad data into the system. And so many of you have asked me the question, like, well, how did you come up with these, with these thresholds? Um, you know, is this set in law? Um, how did you do this? So no, it, you know, there are no thresholds set in the law. Um, we, you know, we, we've seen quite a few different MOUs, labor agreements throughout the years. And um, I sat down with my subject matter experts and we thought we did a very good job of thoughtfully putting these limits into the system. And, and really the, the real thought was, is that, you know, if there was a lump sum, we would see these very high percentages and it would, it would, it would let us know that, hey, there was a lump sum reported and that that had to be backed out and reported as earned. But when we turned this on, we were quite surprised to see some of these very high special comps that were reported. You know, some of them actually turned out to be truly valid. But then there's other issues as well where, you know, there's, there's compounding of special comps. There's some that may be calculated wrong. You know, for, exa for example, I saw a 75% shift differential reported as a special comp for a bus driver. Um, we saw some longevities with some odd percentages that didn't quite match up to the MOU. You know, 29% longevity pay, 36 um, percent, you know, things that weren't matching up. So it actually opened our eyes to there is quite a bit of, of potentially bad reporting out there that could slip through the cracks and members could be put on roll with this bad data. And in turn, it could be backed out. A member might be sent a denial letter and could turn into a, a, an appeal. Um, there could be nasty overpayments associated to that. So our thought was we wanted to set these rules in here to try to prevent that bad data from coming in. Having said that, my eyes are open now that maybe we set the thresholds a little too strict based off of our findings. And yes, you know, we did not send out a circuit letter. My thought behind that was, well, there really wasn't any system changes required for this, right? You didn't have to go to your vendors. You didn't really have to change anything. It should have been reported as earned and per what your MOU is. And having looked at it, I see that there are some where the thresholds need to be adjusted and others where we're doing a deeper dive to see what is the special comp being reported and is it truly compliant? So we made the decision um, because we need to relook at these thresholds to set it to exception. So your payroll will, will, will still post, we'll get these exception reports. And over um, the next six months, maybe to a year, we're gonna be looking at these exceptions, diving into your MOUs, diving into your labor agreements and seeing if we can set the thresholds to the appropriate amounts. And what I ask of you is that if you can help us with that, I would greatly appreciate that. If you have any special comps that are of, of, of higher percentages, you know, over 25, over 30%, you know, could you let me know? Could you send that information to our MOU review mailbox? You know, my email, I've always shared it, is brad.hansen at calpers.ca.gov. And if you'd like, we can, um, we can engage in further discussions on this new rule as well. I'm open to, if I have enough takers, doing another webinar and I can go over the rules with you and I can discuss with you like the thought behind it 
And maybe you can give me some insight too on some of these odd special comps that I've seen. And perhaps we can figure out if it's really a reporting issue or if it's just that your language needs to be updated. Um, so having said that, once we've done this new deep dive and we've discovered what the new threshold should be, we will send out a new circular letter and we will let everybody know when we're gonna turn it back on. As far as those thresholds go, that's considered proprietary information, and we can't share those with you at this time. Um, you know, the thought is, is that if we set the thresholds and let everybody know, potentially bad actors could take advantage of that and report stuff just below thresholds in order to try to get it to post and perhaps be added to someone's retirement account erroneously. Um, so having said that, is there any more questions on this? Renee, did you happen to see any questions coming on the QA when I was talking? Um, I was watching for them, and I know we still have a few um, coming in. I know I see one that's on a little bit different topic. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. I see one from Ramona that's a good question. She's asking about our new MOU review process. So we've always had this process in place where employers can send in their MOUs or labor agreements. We can do a review of your language, let you know if it's compliant or not. If it's not compliant, we can give you suggestions on ways in which that you can make it compliant or just let you know like, hey, this type of special comp isn't reportable. So we have this, um, we have started a new process um, and it's in, in anticipation of that SB 278 because we think we'll be getting quite a few of these going forward. Um, we have a mailbox, mou underscore review at calpers.ca.gov. Many of you probably have worked with him, Kevin Lau. He's the manager over that section. And so the process will be, you could turn your MOU in, into our um, mailbox. We'll get a response back to you in a timely manner. We'll provide you an official letter that says if it's compliant or if it's not compliant. And we commit to working with you to try to, to, to make it compliant if, if necessary. We also have developed a new website. It's on the CalPERS website. It's actually a page on our website, I should say, that will give you lots of valuable information on what should be in your MOU and labor agreements, commonly asked questions, frequently asked questions, if you will. There'll be a section on sample language that you could use to try to draft some of your um, special comp language for your MOU. Um, you know, like things like uniform allowance, education incentive, um, longevity pay. And we'll also have some mocked up publicly available pay schedules out there for you as well. If you would like to take a look to see if yours is compliant or perhaps like take some tips and tricks on how to do that. Also, there will be a link to that to that email box, the MOU review mailbox, um, which you can send that information into. So at the end of the day, I do apologize. We didn't give you um, any heads up about that. I, you know, I, I made a bad decision thinking that, well, there was no system changes required by this, but I just didn't anticipate the type of data that was gonna come in and the impact it would have on your reporting. So going forward as of Monday, it shouldn't jam you up on your payroll. It should go ahead and post. We're gonna be running those exception reports though, taking a look at some of the ones that are breaching these thresholds. And we may be in touch with you to talk to you about those types and see what's really going on with it. Is it bad reporting? Is it bad language? Or is it just something that we missed? Um, someone asked a question about the timely response on the MOE reviews. Normally we'll respond to you within the day that we get the inquiry and we'll ask you to send in the necessary information we need to do the review. I would say, that depending on what you want us to review, if you're just asking us to review like one bit of language for one type of special comp type, it shouldn't take more than three to five days to review. However, if you want us to review your entire MOU and you have numerous different types of special comp types in there, it could take a little bit longer. But in general, it should, shouldn't take more than um, probably five to six days in order to get your review back. And Brad, someone was uh, did just ask the question that they were trying to report a small amount, but they were struggling to try and report it for the period of time it was applicable to. So what uh, mailbox would you like them to contact to try and solve that issue? Hmm. You know, um, that, would, that one would probably go to our payroll team. We may need our um, comp review team to look at that as well. Um, go ahead and send that into the MLU review mailbox and then we'll triage it from there and figure out what's going on. 
you know, one, one thing is I saw on the Q, on the FAQ on the question and answer on here, someone said that they had an off salary schedule pay that wasn't posting. Now with off salary schedule pay, I can share with you the threshold on that one because that one's set in law. If you're reporting an OSSP off salary schedule pay, it cannot exceed 6%. So if your off salary schedule pay is above 6%, it's going to air out. And then there was another question about lump sums as well. And we've been talking about this for the last three or four years. Lump sums are just not reportable to CalPERS. Um, the way our system works, it trolls and finds your highest 12 months for your final comp. So like say for instance, that you report a uniform allowance um, every December and you do it as a lump sum, you don't report it as earned, which per the law, it should be reported as earned. What will happen is let's say that this person retired uh, mid, mid year, they were retired June, 2021 and you prorate their uniform allowance, you report six months of uniform allowance in that June report. So our system will look at June, see those six months of uniform allowance, and then it will also look at December, see those 12 months of uniform allowance, giving them 18 months of that pay. Now my team does a pretty good job of trying to catch those, so does Tim Herbach's team when they go to these reviews. However, sometimes, you know, it's not, it's not abundantly clear and they slip through the cracks. These are the type of things we want to avoid because um, I've seen many audits with huge overpayments associated to this, where members had to pay back thousands of dollars because their allowance was miscalculated. And their onward uh, retirement allowance had to be downwardly adjusted, so it was like a double hit. And again, that law, the SB 278 that's, that's lurking, potentially if that passes, that would go back to you, the employer, to have to pay that back. So we're, that's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to stop the bad data from coming in. And I know many of you are aware of this and are doing your best to do that. And you know, I commend you for that, but we just wanna be there to really cinch it up to make sure that this doesn't happen in the future. Okay, and Brad, there's a question by um, Jade that asks about if they don't know our thresholds, how are they supposed to accurately withhold contributions? And, I, and that's where I think the confusion might be coming in, at least for some, because it really doesn't have to do with the amount of, you know, that whether or not the contributions are right or not on these thresholds, but it's more about these thresholds identifying potential issues that could, it doesn't change the percent you withhold, it changes whether or not it's reportable. Right. So right. I, I want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, like, like for instance, I, there was one we saw, there was a 75% shift differential. Okay, so obviously for shift differential, our threshold is much lower than that. Like you don't normally see a, a shift differential that that's, that's that large. But let's just say that you were able to, in your MOU, your labor agreement, you're able to say, hey, look, this is what it is. And I review it and it's like, hey, you know, this is actually compliant. That's where we can come in and set the threshold to the appropriate amount so it doesn't air out anymore. Um, you know, we have that ability now to where per employer or per employer group, we can set the threshold appropriately. So it's not really set by law. Well, basically what we did is we, using our expertise because we review MOUs constantly, we thought we set, we actually set the thresholds a little bit higher than what we thought we would see, you know. Uh, oftentimes for longevity pay, you don't necessarily see a 39% a longevity. More likely you're gonna see like tops 20%. So we set it like maybe 25%. You know, we set it about 5% higher to allow for the payroll to, to post in, right? But what we ended up seeing was all these astronomical amounts, ones that uh, quite honestly, just me, Kevin, Renee, even we were kind of surprised by because we did not think that we would see employers reporting these very high special comp amounts. And indeed, when we started looking in the MOUs, it, you know, it looks as if the special comps were not calculated correctly, or it wasn't even in the language, which is not compliant. You know, so there was kind of like a hidden bonus to turning these errors on. You know, we were trying to capture a lot of sums, but now we're, our eyes are open to like there might be a lot more other issues out there that could get employers really caught up with having some um, some audits and some comp reviews and potentially having to pay back some of these overpayments. Um, so, you know, that, that's why we're sent to exception for now. We're gonna do a more further analysis and deeper dive into these. You know, if, and, and again, if you reach out to me and you have some language you want us to review for compliance, we'll be glad to do that. And if need be, we could set the thresholds um, specific to your school, to your employer. 
you know, if there really is a 75% shift differential and it's compliant, I'll set the threshold at 75%. That way we can avoid the lump sums and it will post. So, okay, so thank you, Brad. Um, I wanted to, because we're quickly running out of time. Um, Christina does have a couple of questions that she commits to very um, expeditiously answering. So we're gonna have her do those two. And then Susan, I think we'll go to break. So then we can come back for the, um, the second half. That's correct. Yeah, go ahead, Christina. Okay, hi everyone. Um, let's see, now let me get back to them. Okay, so first question is, if an employer did not provide a new employee who is a CalPERS member with a retirement system election form for a certificated position, would CalPERS accept the form months the form months or even years after the appointment start date if the employee chose to elect CalPERS. This would of course require reversing said employee's contributions out of CalPERS where they went by default. Um, and short answer to that is that yes, if the employer can provide um, documentation or backup that they did not provide the election to the member, then we will accept it. Um, that is the short answer again, but however, we'd have to validate um, the appointment and make sure that um, it's compliant. And we'd also, not we, but the employer would also have to communicate with the member before that make, make that election, the contribution and tax implications that could happen as a result. Um, let's see, um, I let me scroll down. I know there was one more. Um, Okay, now I can't find it. It was a, about the appointments um, uh, for certificated members in the system. I can't believe I don't even, I don't see it in here anymore, but there is a new indicator where you have to, um, it's asking you to provide documentation of um, for the certificated employee. And we know that some employers are having issues with that. Um, we are telling everyone to just email us at our membership elections uh, mailbox, and we can assist you with that when you're working in the system for that. Uh, you need help with that indicator. And our mailbox address is pers underscore stirs underscore election at calpers.ca.gov. That's all. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Christina. So yeah, let's take um, a short 10 minute break. Let's all meet back here at 1040.
All right. David, we can um, get started with our second half now. Thank you. All right, welcome back. We're gonna get started with our second half. Rihanna, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Rihanna, like Susan just mentioned, and I'm from the membership review team. Um, today, what we will be going over is similar to the previous um, webinars we did have for completing the employment certification. It's actually all the same um, content. Um, we will just be doing it in kind of a shortened version where um, we will not be pausing quite as often for um, questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and begin. Next slide, please. So the first thing I want to do today is I want to go over the topics that we will be discussing in today's webinar. We will be discussing the required roles in my CalPERS. Um, when an employment certification is required, completing the employment certification, which will include the employment information section and adding service period detail, um, along with submitting the certification. Next slide, please. Additional topics um, will be the missing service period error. So some things to kind of look at if you do receive that error message. Um, the certification status, so um, the status of the employment certification. Arrears determination options in my CalPERS. So once an arrears determination is made by CalPERS, um, what options you as the employer have. Resources, and um, we will also have time, if time allows, for questions. Next slide, please. So the first um, topic that um, we will go over are the required roles in my CalPERS. Next slide, please. So in order to complete this task in my CalPERS, you must be assigned um, the correct roles. The correct roles will be the business partner arrears, so have to have the business partner arrears, along with one or more of the following, which is the business partner payroll, business partner payroll read only, business partner retirement enrollment, the business partner retirement enrollment read only. Um, so in order to complete this task, you'll have to have, like I said, business partner arrears along with one of those um, roles. I know we did have a question in the question and answer that asked if the SCP certification was um, required and actually these are the required roles. It's the SCP certification is not um, one of the requirements. And if you have questions as to whether you have these correct roles, um, you wanna contact your system access administrator um, to make sure that you are assigned them. And Another thing is, just as an example, if you're assigned the business partner arrears role and the business partner retirement enrollment read only role, then you should be able to complete this task in my CalPERS. Next slide, please. So the next topic um, that we will be discussing today is when employment certifications are required in my CalPERS. Next slide, please. So an employment certification can be required in certain situations in which CalPERS requires additional information. So they can be required for service credit purchase requests, which can be initiated by the member through their My CalPERS account or by the member submitting a paper request to their employer um, for upload and certification. Membership reviews also an instance when we need an employment certification. Um, membership reviews can be initiated by CalPER staff, the employer, or the member. It's also possible that a service credit purchase 
can um, turn into a membership review um, if the case is that the member actually qualified for membership during any portion of that service credit purchase timeframe that is being requested. Next slide, please. So the next topic that we will be discussing today is completing the employment certification. Next slide, please. So once you are logged into your MyCalpers account and you've confirmed that you are assigned um, the correct roles, this is what you'll need to do. So step one, you will select the reporting global navigation tab. Step two, you will select the member request local navigation link. So you'll see there in the member request tab. Next slide, please. And then step three, you're gonna review the employment and service period certification list panel. So this is when you'll see the list of outstanding um, certification requests. So the first thing you wanna look at when you're um, looking to complete a certification is, is the employee on the list? So if they are not, you will go ahead and continue to step four. If they are on the list, so you've answered yes, um, you will select the requested status link and continue to step five. Next slide, please. So step four is going to be, you'll have to select add new in the employment and service period certification list panel. So you've determined that the employee is not listed, so you're using that add new option. Next slide, please. So this is just an overview of what um, the employment information section will look like, um, whether you've used that add new option or if you um, selected the request, the status link to get you to this page. And this is what we will be um, breaking down on how to complete it. Next slide, please. So step five is our next step. And you wanna see is, is the employee's information displayed? If yes, you can continue on to step six if it looks correct. If no, you will select the participant link to add the participant's information. And this also goes back to whether or not you use that add new link or if, um, the, the employee's information was already there. Step six, um, you will confirm the correct business partner and division is listed. So in your instance, depending on if you're logging in at the county school level or the district level, um, if you have the option to change that division or not. Next slide, please. Step seven is just simple. You'll need to enter in your contact phone number so that if we have any questions on this employment certification, um, where we can contact you. Step eight, um, you will enter or confirm the employment date. This step is also linked to if you use the add new option or if the employee's information um, was already, already there. So the dates of employment, just want to confirm that they're accurate and um, if they are not there, if this is, you know, based on you received a paper um, service credit purchase request and you need to enter in the dates of employment um, because you use that add new option, this is where um, you will enter in those dates. Next slide, please. Step nine you will select the applicable employment category. So when you're selecting the, cate the employment category, this is gonna be based on the category the employee would have been if they were brought into membership for this position. So let's say, for example, you have a custodian who they are, they would have been a membership, they would have been miscellaneous, 
this is where you would select miscellaneous. Next slide, please. Step 10 is going to be our next step. And this is where you will enter the position title for the certification. Um, in here, it's going to ask for you to enter in the primary position title as it's displayed on your publicly available pay schedule. And then step 11 is going to be what you will see in my calculators. It will ask you, was the participant's employment excluded from CalPERS membership due to your agency's contract agreement with CalPERS. So what we're really looking at for you to answer in this question is, was this employment excluded either due to your agency's contract agreement or by law under government code section 20300? So if, if you know that the position is not excluded, you would just answer no. If this position, you say, yes, it is excluded. You would answer yes, um, and also just want to confirm that the position is excluded. Make sure you've confirmed that it, um, you know, based on your review, it actually is excluded and continue on to step 12. Next slide, please. So for step 12, you will select the time base and tenure um, at the start of the employment period. So if the request began on January 1st, 2019, you will select the time based and tenure effective January 1st, 2019. Um, so when you're looking at the time base and the appointment tenure, um, you will see that if you, if you select part time, the um, scheduled hours work will populate so you can put the number of hours worked per week or if it's a fractional time base so like let's say for example the employee was working half time then you can enter in um, half time or the scheduled hours per week and you'll also see like if you're for the tenure if you select um, seasonal you will have the option for you to enter in um, the the end date of the term Next slide, please. Step 13 is going to be the next step. And you will just um, select the month per year works. And the field is just going to ask for months per year. Um, and it is a required field. Step 14 um, is actually going to be optional. It's going to ask for you to please upload the participant's hiring document. Um, it will say the MyCalpers 2788. Just be aware the MyCalpers 2788 is just how we will see the document when it's incoming for us. That is not the document number we are asking for. We are just looking for um, some type of document maybe that provides the appointment time based and tenure. If you would like to provide that to supplement this employment information section, but it's, it is not a required field at this time. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and um, just want to, want to double check the questions quickly to see if there's any that I can just answer, go over real quick before I turn it over um, to our next presenter. So I see a question from Monica um, regarding substitutes. If you feel that the substitute category would fall in the, into the intermittent category, then yes, that is the, the time base that you can select. And so at this point, um, I know I'm not seeing anything other, but the questions that we do not have time to address will still be sent, sent out um, and answered. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Sierra to continue on with the presentation. Thank you, Rihanna. Um, if we could please go to the next slide. Perfect. Okay. So starting with step 15, it's asking, is the employee requesting to purchase service credit? If the employee is not requesting to purchase service credit, you can just select the no radio button 
and then select save and you would be able to skip to step 21. But if the employee is um, requesting service credit and they've submitted a paper service credit request, just go ahead and select that yes button. And when yes is selected, a list of service credit types will display. If the employee submitted their request through their MyCalPERS account, then these questions will already be populated. Next slide. So if the employee submitted a paper request, then you would want to select the service credit that the employee is requesting. For step 17, you would want to upload the service credit request by first selecting add document. And again, if the employee submitted their request through their MyCalPERS account, then the request will already be uploaded. So you would be able to skip step 17 and 18. Next slide, please. So for step 18, you're going to want to locate the document and select open. Step 19, you will just be answering the remaining questions. So please answer the questions to the best of your knowledge. If you're unsure or if it doesn't apply, please default to no. If the employee was hired as an independent contractor, hired through a third party or a temporary employment agency, you must upload their contract. This field would, will generate once the yes radio button is selected. If the employee contributed to a defined benefit plan, um, you must upload the defined benefit plan information. Next slide. All right, so once completed, you're going to want to select the save button. If there are additional employment periods that need to be added, we ask that you would then return to step number four. Um, additional employment periods that need to be entered would be for a different position. Um, so you would want to include all positions for the period being requested, um, or if there is a time-based change or a separation in, appoint in appointments, you would want to separate and then start again. But if there are no additional employment periods to add, then we can go ahead to proceed to step one of entering the payroll details. On the next slide, please. All right, so we are now going to discuss how to enter the service period detail associated to the requested employment period. Next slide. Okay. So before um, you start entering the payroll detail, ensure that you have the correct roles assigned. So again, like Rihanna mentioned, you must have the business partner arrears role and one of the following, VP payroll, VP payroll read only, VP retirement enrollment, or VP retirement enrollment read only. If you do not have the correct roles, then you will not be able to access the add new service button. So please contact your agency system administrator to request the correct roles. Once you do have the correct roles, then you can proceed with selecting the add new service button. Next slide. Um, so this is where you will begin entering all the payroll details. And on the next few slides, I'll go over how to complete this page. Next slide, please. All right. So you're going to start by entering the begin date and the end date of each pay period that matches the member's payroll schedule. So that could be monthly, biweekly, et cetera. Um, and the payroll schedules can be located under the reporting tab, followed by the payroll schedules tab. Um, multiple pay periods cannot be grouped together and they cannot cross multiple fiscal years. So for example, if the pay period begins June 20th and ends July 15th, then June and July must be separated. It's really critical that you follow these restrictions. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to save the information and submit it. Um, so if the dates that the employee input into MyCalPERS do not match the records um, that you guys are showing, then the employer can adjust the dates to match the true time that they worked for your agency. Next slide. So then for step three, it's gonna ask that you select from the division drop-down menu. 
I do want to note that districts will not see this bill. Next slide, please. So for step four, you're going to enter the employee's position title. And if there are multiple positions during the same period, then you must separate the payroll detail for each position. Next slide. So um, for step five, if you are entering payroll for an employment period not reported to CalPERS, then you would want to select the no appointment radio button if it's not already defaulted. Um, if you're entering payroll for an existing appointment, then please select the radio button for the applicable appointment. And then you will um, select the applicable payroll schedule. Next slide. Um, so step seven, you will select the pay rate type. So it could be monthly, hourly, daily, and you will also enter the full-time pay rate. If the employee is a fractional time-based employee, be sure to enter what the full-time pay rate is for that position. So we need the full-time equivalent pay rate. And then you will go ahead and enter their earnings for that pay period. Next slide. Okay, so next you will either enter the scheduled full-time hours per week or the scheduled full-time days per week. Please report what is considered full-time for the position, whether or not the member worked full-time or not. Next slide. All right, so for here, you're gonna to want to enter the total hours worked for that pay period. If the employee has overtime hours, then please enter those hours into the overtime hours work field. If the employee has any special compensation, then you would want to continue to step 11. But if not, then you can just go ahead and skip to step 16. Next slide. So for step 11, if the member had special compensation, you would want to select the add new button in the view special compensations panel, like you see here. Um, next slide. Then in the maintain special compensation details panel, you're gonna wanna complete the special compensation category type and amount fields. So depending on what compensation category is selected, it will generate different special compensation types. And CalPERS doesn't have this information, this would be known by the employer. And next slide. So um, if there are additional special compensations to add to the records, then you would want to select save and add another, and this will return you to step 11 to repeat that process. But if there are no additional special compensations to add, then you can continue on to step 14. Next slide, please. All right, so on step 14, if there are no additional special compensations to add, then you would just want to select save. And once you select save, then please select return, which is located in the bottom right corner. And next slide, please. All right. So if no additional pay periods need to be reported, then you're good to select the save and return button. If additional pay periods do need to be reported, then you would want to select the save and continue button. Um, if you accidentally create a duplicate payroll line, you can um, select the remove record to just remove just that pay period. Or if you want to delete everything, um, you can select the cancel report. And on the next slide, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ron Ashcraft to continue. Thank you, Sierra. And good morning, everybody. As mentioned, my name is Ron Ashcraft. I'm an analyst here on the membership review team within Employer Account Management Division. And I'll be presenting the remainder of the slides. And so next, we'll be talking about submitting the certification once it's complete. And next slide, please. So of course, prior to submitting the certification, just please confirm that all of the information provided in the employment information and service list panels are complete and accurate. Uh, you will get error message if it's not, we'll talk about that momentarily. 
right here, when you sign and certify this, uh, if you have any issues or if it's not allowing you to certify it and it's not giving an error of missing items, then it's most likely that you don't have the correct roles. So again, that would be, you would need to reach out to your system access administrator uh, to double check that. And next slide, please. And we'll be talking about missing service period error on the next slides and next slide, please. So the error message below will display if any information is missing in the service period detail. Next slide, please. Some common missing items and or items requiring correction before submission can be missing service period. And as an example, uh, you must add zeros to a pay period where there may be no earnings within the certified, uh, excuse me, certification period. Uh, incorrect dates will trigger the error message. Uh, dates outside of the certification period. So always just double check the start date and the end date on the period on the certification request. Next slide, please. Uh, another missing service period error will happen if fiscal year is not separated. Again, it's been mentioned a bit earlier, but that's very critical. If you by chance have uh, pay periods that uh, cross over a fiscal year period from June 30 to, through to July 1, uh, you'll need to separate that particular uh, period into two lines. And to do that, you would add another line. If a day missing from a service period, and one example would be leap year, 28 versus 29 days. Another error message you would get would be to position title not matching the pay period detail and employment information. And an, as an example, information technology one is entered in the employment information, but entered as IT one in the pay period detail. Next slide, please. Just checking the questions and answers. I don't see too many there. We can hold on a moment. Uh, we're going to go over the different statuses that the certification will be in along the path. Next slide, please. So when status is requested, of course, that is when the certification has been requested, but not yet started in progress will mean that certification has been started, but not completed or submitted. Certification expired. Uh, this is particularly for service credit purchase requests not completed within 30 days. Next slide, please. Status of submitted, of course, is that you have completed and submitted it successfully uh, for CalPERS to review and completed is that the certification process is complete. Next slide, please. So next we're gonna talk about some options if there is an arrears determination made. Uh, one thing just to remember that, and it's been mentioned, but everyone remember that the request can be generated from service credit purchase request and or from the member or the employer CalPERS uh, needing to do a review. Uh, so sometimes it turns into an arrears termination and sometimes it does not. So next slide, please. If there is an arrears determination made upon the review, uh, this is where you'll find the details to the, to the information. Um, the path just to get to this link is also clearly outlined in the uh, student guide for this certification process. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more in a moment. So once you click on the details, uh, next slide, please. So this is where you have an opportunity uh, that if you do not disagree with our arrears determination, or if you are in agreement with it, uh, you may use this wave appeal button here. And if your agency does that, uh, then the, process, the arrears process will happen overnight without waiting the remainder of the mandatory 30 days uh, required by the Public Employees Retirement Law. So that is where you'll utilize 
that decision. And next slide, please. Here's a good new feature on this, that if you disagree with our determination, you can appeal it. We provide all parties 30 days by law for the appeal process. But remember as well that during that time frame, uh, we have the time for reconsideration. We don't necessarily need to go into full appeal mode, getting legal on board and everything at first. Uh, if you disagree and you want a reconsideration, this is where you would put your reason why in the box and you can, and we highly suggest you upload any supporting documentation that you have that supports your disagreements and your request for a reconsideration. And those documents can be anything. We may have missed it. We may not have had all the information uh, when we've made the first determination. So by all means, uh, feel free to upload any and everything that you believe will support your disagreements. So that can be hiring documents or any personnel action forms for appointment changes, anything. Uh, one other thing I'd like to mention on this is that you need to do this within 30 days. It's very imperative. If when we are doing a re-review, if you will, or reconsideration, and say perhaps it all takes longer than 30 days, we will still honor this date that you submitted the request for reconsideration to be within the 30 days required by law so that if after a re-review, when you request a reconsideration, if we do not change our determination and we stand firm on it, and you still would like to officially appeal through the uh, law judge administration, uh, you certainly can. We will honor that date. Next slide, please. Well, next, we're going to talk about a few resources available to you as business partners and employers. Next slide, please. Our customer contact center is toll free 888-CALPERS or 888-225-7377. Most inquiries and issues can be resolved at point of contact by using the contact center. Uh, if it cannot be at the point of contact, they have the ability to escalate inquiries to the appropriate program area or areas if multiple program areas are involved so that it can get more into the subject matter experts possession and perhaps the analyst who's working a case and they can reach back out and contact the employer for further assistance. Circular letter 200-042-20 is the circular letter we issued September 4th of 2020 that announced this new functionality uh, coming out. Uh, one thing to mention as well, that within that circular letter, I recommend all business partners read that if they haven't yet. There's also um, uh, resources, links to resources at the end of that circular letter as well, uh, including these that we're looking at, plus an additional uh, couple links for you. Uh, if you find that you'd rather not call the contact center, uh, and by the way, you can also send secure messages uh, through your login, MyCalPERS account, um, in a similar fashion as you would call the contact center. Uh, those questions can be responded to in the same manner. Uh, if you need or want to submit anything by email regarding membership or membership reviews, uh, we have our membership mailbox here, membership underscore reporting at calpers.ca.gov. Uh, just keep in mind that those also need to be triaged by our support staff. Uh, they will also uh, need to be assigned out to uh, appropriate analysts by the team leaders uh, to then address. Uh, the next item here is the actual uh, student guide for the employment certification functionality. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention on this as well is that it's been revised uh, a couple times, edited and updated and improved uh, since its original date. Uh, the current revision date is April 24th, 2021. Uh, just a reminder that if you're one that likes to print out information, 
uh, we, we, we remind you that it could be outdated by the time you look at it again on your desk. So always refer back to the online documents. And we've also learned that if by chance you are pulling up the student guide from a link that you were previously given and you're not seeing the most current uh, revision date, which is April 24th, 2021, we've been advised that you might need to just refresh your browser to pull that up. Uh, the next item is the student guide for your system access administrator. Uh, every CalPERS employer uh, is required to have a system access administrator. Uh, they are the ones that will uh, handle and make sure that all your contacts and all the specific roles and contacts information are all updated and correct. And then last, uh, the system privileges for business partner roles drills down deeper into the different privileges and what roles allow what staff to do what processes and also which ones they would not be able to do. And so with that said, uh, this is the last slide. If you can go to the next slide, please. So at this point, we're going to hand it over to our team leader, Christina Bozo Baldenegro. She's the team leader of membership review team. And we'll go continue to answer as many questions as we possibly can. And Christy will take it from here. And I thank you for allowing me to be here with you today. And thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Ron and Sierra and Rihanna for doing such a great job on the presentation. And just to let the employers know that attended our most recent webinar, we are finalizing our responses to the questions that um, occurred during that webinar. And we'll be getting out those out as soon as we possibly can. So I'm gonna go back through some of the answered questions in the um, Q&A and Tammy Knott asked, will CalPERS be updating my CalPERS so that it will send some type of notification to employers when there is a new employment certification request? Tammy, currently we do not have that um, notification going out. We are working on a system enhancement. We have heard, um, heard from you, the employers, um, loudly that you would like some email notifications. So we are working on that enhancement, but until that time, we'll need you to regularly check that tab um, for new member requests that come up in my CalPERS in your account. We have another question that was answered. We have a part-time employee that did not qualify for membership at the time of hire. She has worked for us consistently for a couple of years. The district she works for recently increased her hours, which causes her to mandatorily qualify for PERS membership. She did not notify us that she was working with a different agency and became a member for 2020 Would this require a MEM 1344 certification? We're now going to refer to that as employment certification in my CalPERS. And yes, who would be responsible for the members' contributions for the last year? So Shauna, in this case, we would need to um, review the appointment history and determine if one of the appointments was uh, contributory or non-contributory. So feel free to reach out to the membership reporting email box. I've added that um, um, information in the Q&A um, and we can review the member's appointment history for you. And if fact um, we need to do a certification request, we can certainly take care of that. We had another question um, from Ramona. What service credit purchase type do you select if they are wanting to purchase service credit while they are out on leave? That option is not available. And Amanda answered it. If the member provides an employer a paper leave of absence request, please complete the paper request and return it to CalPERS. Oops, where did the thing go? Um, we are encouraging members to submit all service credit requests through their MyCalPERS account. We had another question, employment certification. I would like to know why there is not a way to upload an Excel file into the system. And um, we are processing service credit requests that can involve hundreds of lines for substitutes, classified substitutes to various positions. And we would like to complete an Excel document to get the information and then have to re-enter it line to re-enter it line by line. Um, and we understand as um, at my at CalPERS that this is not effective for you or the members. 
Um, so we do have a future enhancement that's coming. And Cynthia Brown from payroll responded at this time, we'll only accept um, an XML file from a county office of education or districts that report payroll directly to CalPERS. A payroll, so a payroll software vendor or your IT department would need to establish the required XML format for uploading. The XML file, require, file requirements are in the CalPERS Employer Technical Toolkit on the CalPERS website. CalPERS is working on implementing a CSV format to allow for a simpler method to upload. We're hoping to have this enhancement in by the end of the summer this year. And I have time for a few more questions. I have recently reviewed a prior to membership and it's requesting a range of time in between the dates for which two years she did not work for us. Do I have to enter 24 lines with zero service? If there is a gap, uh, the answer would be if there is a gap of more than a few months, you may complete separate certifications so you will not have to enter pay roll reports for the periods not worked. So you are able to go in and enter separate pay lines, um, pay periods or certifications in that request. If you need some additional guidance, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, let's see. Okay, um, or my, it looks like Bill's ready to jump in. So we do have a, a number of other questions that we appear to have been answered and we will certainly membership and SCP and payroll follow up with responding to the remaining questions um, so that you have the answers to all of these um, in the upcoming future. So I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I am your host. Bill Greenhall. Um, I'd like to introduce to you our new Assistant Division Chief, um, Christina Rollins. Christina. Hi. I, hi, everyone. I'm familiar with um, most of you. Um, I've worked with you for many years, but um, I am the new Assistant Division Chief over Membership Services. So my teams are the Membership Review Team, the membership and post-retirement employment determinations team, the member election team, and the state social security administrator. So if you have any questions that come up um, uh, outside of the SEAC or in the SEAC, you can um, send me an email or give me a call and I'll be happy to answer those questions for you. Thanks. Okay, okay are there any other questions? for Christina, um, either, either Christina. Yeah, um, Susan, if I can chime in on a couple of things that I saw in the questions and answers um, that I would like to go over that I feel is really important for the audience. Uh, Vina, I heard you loud and clear. You're asking for a, a cheat sheet um, of some sort for the, the student guide. And just to let you know, I, I, I think I read your mind on that one. I am working on a reference page to put in my CalPERS that will help a lot of you um, define more, uh, have a lot of more Q&A, things that we've already come across in these uh, uh, conferences that we have with our employers that you guys might find helpful. There will be um, an announcement sent out to let everybody know where that page is, where to find that information, but we're hoping by the end of June. Um, so hopefully that helps you, Vina. In the meantime, you can always reach out to Christina, myself, or Christy. Um, and then Nancy, you asked a question about the time frame once the employee submits a request certification through their MSS and the employer submits the request on their behalf. Uh, the time frame is 30 to 60 days for our service credit purchase team to get that completed. However, if it is an arrears type of situation, the arrears team or membership team has 120 business days to complete that arrears review. It takes time to get the employment information back to the employer and can take time. So um, it can be lengthy um, or it can be short depending on what we need uh, from the employer and how quickly the employer gets back to us. So hopefully that answers your question, Nancy. The next question was from Nina. Thanks, Nina, for asking this. It is a common question regarding if there's no earnings during a, a payroll period and you would need to enter zero for that month. Uh, to report zero earnings um, if they had none. Um, so that is a requirement of the certification process when uh, you're entering in that payroll. Um, and let's see, I think, um, I 
think that's all the questions that I wanted to review with everyone uh, that I thought was important to clarify. And uh, again, we're always here to support you. If um, you had any specific questions that didn't get answered, please send them to Christina Rollins or myself, and we will reach out one-to-one -one and get some assistance for you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Michelle. So yeah, it is getting near 1130 and we want to re be respectful of your time. There are some more questions that we were unable to get to. So we'll get those answers and respond to you by early next week. Also, we're going to be sending out a report that shows all the questions and the answers that were submitted during the webinar. A survey is going to be sent to all attendees immediately after uh, we end this webinar. And we encourage you to complete and submit the survey. And finally, as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and it'll be available on our website next week. We want to thank our presentation team and um, all of you, our employers, for your questions and comments. So Cal Sturz will be hosting the afternoon session of the Employer Advisory Committee meeting at 1230. And you can log on to the Cal Sturz website to join their meeting. So we do appreciate your time today. Thank you again and be safe and have a great afternoon.